Hello, Williamson County Emergency Services. It's Tanya Glenn, and I'm bringing you the sixth brief for the COVID pandemic series. Today, I wanted to talk to you about stress and trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder, and also about grief. While this series is designed to address the COVID issue, I really think it applies to a lot of things going on today. It's been a very tough summer for a lot of first responders. So I'm hoping that the trauma portion and the grief portion of what I'm teaching today is gonna really ring true for a lot of you, even if you're not struggling with necessarily COVID issues, but some of the other things going on as well. The first thing I wanna mention is that there's a thing called post-traumatic stress syndrome. Now, this is because when the brain is exposed to traumatic events, it's normal to have a series of reactions. The difference between post-traumatic stress syndrome and post-traumatic stress disorder is that post-traumatic stress syndrome will typically resolve itself. In other words, it's really normal after a tough call to go through several days to weeks of like reliving it and having some nightmares, you know, just really kind of struggling with getting that call to, to start to fade to your long-term memory. What happens with a healthy, resilient brain is it does resolve, and that is the case of post-traumatic stress syndrome. Now, I wanna say that just because it resolves, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't wait around to see if it's a, an issue or if it becomes an issue. I want you to understand that it's okay to come in and ask for help with any call that's bothering you, no matter how short the duration after the call. I want you to understand that it's really okay to get help even if it doesn't become post-traumatic stress disorder. We're actually mitigating all of it, which is really important. So now let's talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. This is basically when you're exposed to a stress trauma so extreme, it's beyond your human coping capacity. And everybody has a human coping capacity beyond which they become overwhelmed. Post-traumatic stress disorder is very severe. It absolutely interferes with your level of functioning in your daily life. And it really is a very pervasive, awful thing. And we don't want anybody to live with this. Where it all starts is with your interpretation. We all have different interpretations and your interpretation is based on your history, your prior training, your successful resolution of previous trauma, your exposure to previous trauma and to, to those types of events that are high stress. And over time, our coping capacity, our threshold increases, which is great. But remember that everybody has their point beyond which they become overwhelmed. And it starts with your interpretation. If your interpretation is that this is no big deal and you've seen 25 of these, that's your interpretation. But if someone else's interpretation is that this is the worst thing they've ever seen, then that's their interpretation. So it's all normal and it's all understandable based on our histories and our perspectives. What happens with trauma that becomes problematic is what you see here, taste, touch, and smell gets trapped in the frontal lobe of your brain. Your frontal lobe, normally what it does, it takes what you see here, taste, touch, and smell, and it passes it off to your prefrontal cortex. Your prefrontal cortex then decides, oh, this is short-term or long-term memory depending on relevance. What happens with trauma is your frontal lobe captures what you see here, taste, touch, and smell, and it hangs on to it for you for later on. Now, what we're looking for is that this is going to resolve, but a lot of times with severe trauma, it just doesn't. At the same time that your frontal lobe is capturing what you see here, taste, touch, and smell, your prefrontal cortex basically has turned off. So what this means is that in high stress situations, when your heart rate hits 180 beats per minute, the physiological side effect is that your prefrontal cortex shuts off. When that shuts off, your frontal lobe is capturing what you see here, taste, touch, and smell, and your prefrontal cortex, because it has shut down, is not managing your memory. It's not pushing things to short-term or long-term memory. So this is kind of a complete shut down. Now this isn't post-traumatic stress disorder yet, right? But these are the sort of the distant early warning signs that we may have some issues coming. Then what happens is, and this is normal, you replay the call over and over and over and over again. You see it, you hear it, you smell it, you taste it, you have nightmares about it, and it's very much like it's in your face all the time. What I want you to understand is that for the first few days after traumatic calls, you are going to replay them. That is your brain's way of starting to work through what you have dealt with. It is normal, although unpleasant, it is normal to have nightmares for the first few nights because your brain is downloading and processing and kind of grappling through this call. So while they're not pleasant, it's actually healthy for a couple of nights to have some nightmares. But here ultimately is what we're looking for. 
by seven days post-incident, where we want our first responders is that that call is starting to fade. In other words, you don't see it and hear it and smell it like you did on days one, two, and three. By 14 days post-incident, we want this thing banked in your long-term memory. In other words, you may never forget this call, but it's as though it's fading to your long-term memory. You don't see it, hear it, smell it, taste it like you did, and the nightmares have ideally stopped. Now here's the thing. If at 14 days, this call is still very much in your frontal lobe and in your face, we want you to get help. At this point, this is all prevention. This is not post-traumatic stress disorder yet. And I give you guys 14 days because most first responders with a series of calls already under your belt and all of the distractions of future calls after the trauma, what happens is you guys tend to resolve it pretty quickly. So it's alarming to me as a clinician who's been working with you guys for 28 years that if you haven't pushed it to your long-term memory by two weeks out, that to me is a sign that maybe your brain is really struggling with this one. So we want you to get help. And again, it's all preventative at this point. What happens if you don't get help and it eventually becomes post-traumatic stress disorder is it basically hijacks your limbic system. And your limbic system is your emotional regulation side of the house. It's your anger management center. It's your emotional control. It's your fight or flight mechanism. This thing is really important. And when it's not intact, a lot of things start to go wrong. So specifically what happens over time is as the trauma is stored in your frontal lobe, what you see here, taste, touch, and smell, you begin to relive that over and over and over again during the day and in nightmares. And these triggers sometimes cause a physiological reaction of a fight or flight response. In that fight or flight response, you produce adrenaline, glucose, and cortisol. And what we have figured out is the cause of post-traumatic stress disorder is the cortisol crosses the blood-brain barrier and it hits this thing called your hippocampus. Your hippocampus helps you manage trauma and loss. So when the cortisol hits your hippocampus, it causes it to shrink, and that's bad news. We figured this out with our Vietnam veterans, known cases of PTSD and post-mortem autopsies. This is how we begin to understand the physiology of post-traumatic stress disorder. The good news here is that your hippocampus can and will repair itself if you get help. It'll generate new neural pathways and it will grow back. And really, it's the only portion of your brain that can do this. And we are banking on your hippocampus's ability to heal when you come in and get help. When your hippocampus shrinks, it then hijacks your amygdala. And this is your caveman. This is your fight or flight response. So when your amygdala gets hijacked, what happens? Your limbic system is malaligned. And what happens is you default to fight and run all the time because you can't default to everything's fine because then you would die in danger. When your amygdala defaults to fight and run all the time, you are constantly, constantly in a state of that super hypervigilance and fight or flight. And this is absolutely miserable. These are the three elements of post-traumatic stress disorder, those intrusive images, those ongoing recurring nightmares, and all of those triggers that constantly, constantly hit you all day long. Sometimes you don't even know what they are. It could be as simple as a smell or, or something you hear on the TV. The arousal is that, that fight or flight response that you have over and over again, of course, producing adrenaline, glucose, and cortisol, which causes then, of course, all the problems with the hippocampus. And then the avoidance, which is all that time and energy we spend just trying to stuff it and forget about it and push it down and not think about it. And of course, the number one way people try to avoid is through alcohol, which can create a whole other series of problems. So we want you to get help. It's very, very important. We don't want anybody to live with this. My favorite modality, as many of you know, happens to be eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. This is hands down one of the biggest tools we have in our toolbox. It is my favorite thing to do. It is fast, it is effective. First responders love it because it is so fast and so effective. And so understand that when you look for a good trauma therapist, what you wanna look for is someone who is trained in a number of modalities. And if you specifically are interested in EMDR, ask that person how long they've been trained, what level of trauma that they have worked with clients on, and what kind of knowledge they have of first responders so we can make sure it's a good fit. Through all of this, we want you to remember your resilience, right? The resilience means that stress impacts everybody, but resilient people always bounce back. So resilience really truly on any given day, are you low, moderate, or highly resilient? We want you to come to work highly resilient. At this point during this pandemic, it's very tough. It's been a very tough summer. I think everybody's resilience has been sliding towards moderate to low because people are fatigued. It is so very important. Hydration, nutrition, rest, and exercise, your family, your faith, your friends, your hobbies, your life outside the job, as much as you can do that now more 
more than ever, let's start to work on those things. I also want to talk to you about grief. A lot of people have lost loved ones and in very awful, traumatic, horrible ways. Um, we have been pulled apart as a society in terms of, of not being able to visit patients. There's been sudden dramatic deaths. There's been all kinds of things going on with first responders. So while there's the, sort of the clean stages of grief, um, what I always add, especially for first responders, is shock. Because a lot of times when you lose someone traumatically, there's a state of just sort of this numbing and shock that kicks in first. And then, of course, we get into the, the denial and the bargaining, the anger and the depression and the acceptance. We've, we've learned this over and over again over time. And while this is a kind of a clean version of grief, I think that this is a much more realistic version of grief. It is an absolute arduous process. I always tell people, you have to walk through your grief. You can't go over it, you can't go under it, you can't go around it. You have to allow your brain to work through this. Human beings, we're designed to cry. And I know crying is a, for many people is a sign of weakness. Understand that when you cry, your brain is offloading all kinds of stress and trauma and strain. Tears are full of toxins. It's like poison leaving the body. No one's immune to trauma and grief. And so understand that when you allow yourself to sit with those awful feelings when they happen and as often as they happen, you are going to work through it much more quickly. Now, as type A's, we tend to want to think our way through our grief. We want to cognitively work our way through it and think through it. But really, honestly, all it does is prolong the grief process because that grief is waiting for you uh, when you finally sit down and deal with it. I think for most people, they would describe their grief more like this, right? It is, it is a, just a free-for-all. And so understand that as you're going through these phases, you know, you're not going crazy because one day you seem okay or one minute you seem okay and the next day or the next minute you're losing it, right? This is the grief process. And what it's like, it's like these big waves and these waves are crashing on you initially and they're big and they're heavy and they hurt and they, they feel like they're drowning you. And over time, as you work through your grief, what you notice is that those big waves start to slow down and they're not near as heavy and then they're not near as intense and they're not near as often. And you start to kind of pick your head up above the water. You see the future and you see the path ahead. That's the grief. And then when you think you're getting, getting somewhere in this grief process, here comes another big, nasty, awful wave and it crashes right on top of you. So don't be surprised. If it feels like two steps forward and three steps back on certain days, that's normal. We all have to walk through this process together. The bottom line, now more than ever, first responders need to get help. I cannot, cannot stress this enough. Now more than ever, we need to rally around each other. We need to embrace each other. We need to support each other. And we need to be there for each other. Whether it's a fellow employee, a peer support team member, a clinician, your, your chaplains, your clergy, whatever resources you have and need, reach out to them. Because the healing starts immediately. Honestly, I have worked with some of my patients starting when they were still in the intensive care unit. That's how quickly we're starting the preventative work to make sure people heal properly. I cannot, cannot stress how important it is that everybody, when you need help, that you reach out and you get it. That takes me to the end. I absolutely adore you guys. Please hang in there. Thank you for everything you do. Please understand you are loved and you are cherished, and we absolutely support you. Thank you.